God. Hey, grab your notes for today's message out of your worship guide or digital note takers. You can take it right there on the church app. I want to say welcome again to all of you online watching. The notes are there for you as well. I hope that you're surviving 21 days of prayer and fasting. This is the landing strip last week. Some of you uh, had a few conversations and I thought, well, we'll just pick this up after prayer and fasting. I can tell you haven't had coffee. You know, some of you are dealing that deal. Uh, I shared a few weeks ago with you my son who's six, fasting TV and sugar. And uh, so he's still staring at blank televisions and asking every day, hey, dad, what day of the fast are we on? And so I told him yesterday, I said, buddy, it ends on next Sunday. And he said, Tomorrow? I said, no, next Sunday. He went, oh, okay, Dad. But he's hanging in there, and I hope that you are as well. I really hope, though, more, and I'm trying to explain this to a six-year-old and explaining it to ourselves as well, me included. Hey, it's not just about giving something up. It's not just about saying, whoo, I made it without sugar for 21 days. It's about every time you get that craving, that itch, that you go, hey, Jesus, Thank you for today. I, I'm so glad that I have the blessings that I've got. Or I'm struggling over here. Help me. That's the point of 21 days of prayer and fasting. To disconnect from the world and to reconnect to God just a little bit deeper. And then we're going to conclude this, this coming Sunday, 5 p.m. here at the Alabaster Campus with a night of prayer and worship. It's always powerful. So, um, so come and be a part of that. Put that on your calendar. I'm telling you, you're not going to want to miss it. It's going to be a good night together. All right? Hope you got your notes ready. Look, today we continue our series, Slay. Uh, slay simply means to do it big, to get it right, to win, to be successful. And that's what we want to do in 2023. I know that um, it can become something that we either say that we want to do every year. We have some people who are big like New Year's resolution people. you got charts and graphs and calendars and all the things that you do for at least two or three weeks, right? And then uh, we have some of us that go, well, I've tried that. That's kind of silly. Uh, we tried to do all the New Year's stuff, and that didn't work, so we just don't do it anymore. Uh, but here's what we believe, and we say it every year, and I think it's true, that if it's our best year spiritually, it'll be our best year ever. That when we align ourselves with the heart of God and He becomes at the center of everything we do, that's where we find success. Because the Bible teaches us, thankfully, this ought to be a breath of fresh air for all of us, the top of your outline, Ephesians 3.20. This will bring you life. Now to Him who is able, <clears throat> some of us think it's us, but it's not, to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to, here's the secret sauce, His power that is at work within us. Meaning this, we've tried it before, but we have did it within ourself, and now we're going to recognize 21 days, set ourselves apart, new year, God, you've got this, this is you. And for you, to you be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever, amen. So everything we've tried and we've failed at, it's because I didn't have the ability to do it. I'm not equipped for it. I don't have enough discipline within myself. I don't have enough skill within myself to do it. But when God gets in the middle of it, he can do immeasurably more than we can ever ask, think, or imagine. So in this series, we've started off kind of unconventional in a way. In week one, we talked about slay financially. And I know that a financial message is not always like the crowd favorite, right? It's like, oh, we're talking about money. But here's the reality. The top five things across America that people said that they want to get under control this year, finances makes the list. Finances still brings married couples to the table uh, considering a divorce and a separation. Finances still keeps people awake at night with the pressure and the worry about money and providing and work and all the things. So it's very important because there's a spiritual connection to the, uh, to the finances of our life. It's, it's connected together. It's not separate. And so we talked about that in week one, how to slay financially. Last week we talked about slay physically. Come on, some of us, we, we're, we're doing good. Some of you started that resolution, you've ended the resolution, but today you can get back on it, right? You can get yourself healthy this year because, again, we like to compartmentalize, but there's a spiritual connection to our physical life. The Bible says we were bought at a high price. We don't belong to ourselves, and therefore we should honor God with our bodies. It is a true form of worship. It matters. And today, everybody do this with me. Go, because today's heavy, all right? We're going to talk about slay mentally. And I think this is important because this is one of those subjects and topics, we're going to talk about our mental health, that's often skipped over in the church. And I don't know why we skip over this in the church, but we do. And we see in our culture 
right now, and many of us struggle in different areas of our life. It's the pressure and the worry and all the stuff and the mental state of our life. We're going to get that under control this year because I think something's happening. You know, the, the Bible says the enemy comes to do what? Steal, kill, and destroy. And he's got these tactics, and nothing's new under the sun. So let me go ahead and tell you, nothing is new. He, he doesn't have any new resources to bring against us. However, in the last decade or so, we have seen that this attack on our mental health becomes something more recognized in our culture. We see more people dealing with it. And I think there's a shift that's taken place from external things that we deal with to internal things. Some of you grew up in like in the 70s or 80s, and maybe you can think about this. Maybe if you were even a parent back there then, or you can think about your parent telling you. Like when you left home, the number one worry that your parent had was that you were going to go to a party, and there was going to be underage drinking at the party, right? That there's a big don't drink. You shouldn't be drinking. And then they worried about drinking and driving. And then depending on which home you were raised in is if you were going to have premarital sex or unprotected premarital sex, right? That was a thing. That was a conversation, a big worry because, God forbid, he was the worst of what a family had to deal with. You came home as a teenage pregnancy. Now what are we going to do with this? That was like 80s, you know, 90s sort of situation. But now when you talk to young people, you see this shift from these external factors that we worry about to now they're internal, they're deeper. You see that they're overloaded with anxiety. You see that teenagers are dealing with depression. You see this deep sense of worry, this selflessness, this, this emptiness that they're experiencing, which leads to self-harm, which ultimately, unfortunately, we see that oftentimes it leads to suicide. Suicide is the second leading cause of death among young people. There's a problem in our country in our culture with our mental health. And I would go as so far as to say that there's probably some of us in this room struggling here today, and we just don't know what to do about it. But here's what I want us to know, is that God's not taken off guard by it. This is not something new. Now, the culture will paint it as something new. Uh, we'll respond to it as if we've never seen it before. As a matter of fact, in December of 2021, the Surgeon General let a very rare public health warning advisory saying, hey, we have a mental health crisis in our country. Doctors and psychiatrists and counselors are saying that we don't have enough people to address the problem in those practices and we don't have enough resource or understanding information as to why this public health crisis is happening, especially amongst our young people. But I believe today that God covers everything in His Word. And so we're going to tell a story out of 1 Kings chapter 19. We're going to just talk about three verses today from a guy's life named Elijah. Elijah was a prophet, and that just means God used him in a powerful way to speak some things and to do some things and to give some examples for us today to follow. But this guy, I believe, had a struggle with his mental health. And the Bible's going to give us five ways in which you and I are made up, five just ways that our bodies are put together that I think are going to help us in these areas. And I believe that today you may identify some of this in some aspect of your life. And God's going to give us some wisdom today on, on how to walk this out. So I recognize today that this is a little heavier for us today. But I believe in the midst of the heaviness, God's going to lighten some of our load and we're going to leave a little more free than we walked in the building with today. So I'm just asking you to hang with me. Let's pray together and let's ask God to help us to navigate this word today and really speak to the deepest, most hidden parts of our life and our struggles. All right? Father, I love you. Thank you for everybody in this room, everybody watching online. God, I pray that today we wouldn't have a distraction in our mind or in our heart, but today we would see you clearly. Speak life to us today through your word, Father. I know that you're going to do something powerfully important in us today. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm going to give you the setup of this guy named Elijah, and I'm going to bring you to where we're going to wrestle through a few scriptures that shows where he's at today, and it's on the screen for you, 1 Kings 19, 3 through 5, and here's what it says, Elijah was afraid, and he fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I'm no better than my ancestors who have already died. Then he lay down and he slept under a broom tree, but as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. See, we see this guy that's seemingly at a very low moment of his life. We're going to talk about how he got there and what's going on in his life, but we're going to unpack a few things that I believe God's going to help us as God begins to deal with Elijah as he's sitting there at his lowest 
of the low. Now, every one of us in this room, let's just go ahead and understand it. We're all broken people, right? We're born into a sinful world. Because of Adam and Eve and because of the decisions they made, we're all broken. We're broken in different ways. I struggle with something that you may not struggle with. I have feelings about things, insecurities about things. It may not be a problem for you. You may struggle with something that I would never even conceive to be a problem in my life. But every one of us are broken in different ways. It's just because we live in a sin-fallen world. But in the makeup of who we are and how God created us in our design, I think there's five things today that we'll recognize that God wants to use in helping us navigate our mental health. Number one, write this down. Here's one of those factors. It's my chemistry. My chemistry. I think you probably will be hard-pressed in most atmospheres like this inside the church walls to find somebody talk about this with you. Not that they don't, but it's, it's rare and in between. But I think this is important to understand. The Bible says right here, Elijah was afraid. Underline the word afraid. He was afraid and he, fe- uh, uh, he fled for his life. Now the question here is, is, why is Elijah afraid? Well, he's running for his life for some reason and, and we don't know why. Well, let me back it up and tell you. Write this reference down. Go back and read. Uh, it's in 1 Kings chapter 17. There's a story where God has sent Elijah out on this you know, this life journey of his. God's got something he wants to accomplish through Elijah. And he gets out on this journey, and where he finds himself, literally, there's, there's no fast food. There's no drive throughs There's no McDonald's. There's no Starbucks. There's no gas stations of 7-Eleven with slurpy machines and all that kind of stuff. There's nothing like that. And the guy's hungry. One of the basic needs of life is what? Food, water. But God says, hey, man, don't worry. I got you. Here's what's going to happen. Every day I'm going to feed you by ravens. Birds are going to come by. They're going to drop you chicken nuggets, and it's going to be awesome. Okay? Now, I don't know about you. Now, I love the Lord, and he's been so so present in my life. But I've never had him feed me by wild birds. This just never happened. But I would like to believe if God fed me by wild birds, I'd never question God again. You know what I'm saying? But we've all had those moments where we said, God, if you just, I would never again. And then you find yourself, you're questioning God again. But here's Elijah literally out in the middle of nowhere, no fast food, but yet McDonald's is still dropped into his lap every day. Here come, caw the bird. It's amazing. It's true. The Bible really calls it to happen. Then in that same chapter, God says, okay, Elijah, I need you to move on. And you're going to go to this house, and I want you to knock on the door, and there's a widow that lives in this house, this widow and her son. And so Elijah sees this house, knocks on the door, and there she is. Another miracle takes place, and Elijah goes, hey, I'm thirsty. She's like, okay, let me get you some water. And he says, while you get the water, can I have some bread to eat? And she says, sir, I, I don't have a piece of bread in this house. She said, as a matter of fact, my son and I are about to cook the very last of a meal that we have, and then we're going to die because we have nothing left. Elijah's like, oh, no, you see, I got God, and he'd been feeding me by ravens, and he told me that you were about to feed me, so go ahead and cook that up, and let's go ahead and have a meal. And she does, and there's more than enough for them to eat. Another miracle takes place. Pretty cool, right? But then in that same chapter, later on, the Bible says that woman's son gets sick, and every day he gets sicker and sicker and sicker until he dies. And she's distraught. Here is this man of God that's been brought to her home, and she's been taking care of him. She's been honoring God, and her son dies, and Elijah's like, hey, nope, don't worry about it. You go ahead and get breakfast on, and I'm going to go upstairs. I'll be back in a minute. Kind of creepy, right? But she trusts him. Elijah goes upstairs, prays, begs God over this boy. God heals this boy, brings him back to life. They all walk down, have breakfast together, and talk about how cool God is. Pretty amazing. Then in 1 Kings 18, the next chapter, you got all these what my mom would call heathens. Y'all know what a heathen is? Somebody just don't obey the rules, right? The culture's gone wild. Not like our culture today that really honors God and loves God. Well, maybe it is kind of like our culture today. A bunch of heathens, right? And they're all worshiping these foreign gods, and they're all saying, our God is the best, your God is the worst, our God can beat up your God. That's what's happening. Elijah's the only one that goes, uh-uh. See, you don't understand. He's been giving me McDonald's. He sent me to a widow. We've been having feast on food. They were about to die. The son literally died and then lived again. So you don't know my God. And so there's this amazing showdown on this mountain. These heathens are cutting themselves and bleeding and crying out to their God. And nothing happens. And Elijah's like, this is what we would say in the south. Hey, y'all watch this. Right? (laughs) Elijah just walks up. Hey, y'all watch this. Rolls up his sleeves. Calls out to God. And God shows up. And it's this mind-blowing moment. I mean, what the highest of the high. Like, Wow untouchable but because of this showdown on this mountain Elijah calling out these false gods he ticked off the people in authority 
And they said, oh, no, that's not how we roll. You're messing up our rule. So Elijah, I'm going to kill you. And then the Bible says, after he gets this death threat, he runs in fear for his life. I'm like, dude, how did you just forget all this stuff that happened? You ought to be like, no, uh I'm ready for this. But have you ever noticed that there's times and seasons of your life that even when it's the best of the best, you still feel the lowest of the low. And you can't make sense of it. And somebody says, how do you feel? And you say, well, I feel awful. And they go, why? And you go, I don't know. It's because our bodies have a chemistry that you can't control and that you didn't choose. And we're broken people. It's like some of you are low pain tolerance people. You got any of those in your family? They stump their toe and you got to carry them to the bed. Make them some chicken noodle soup. Say, it's going to be okay. I'm so sorry you stumped your toe. It's, it's, it's going to be okay. But could I, could I get some Sprite too? Could I get a little bit of that? Just low tolerance pain people. And then you got some, you, you, they're indestructible. My wife, indestructible. Like you, she just, she like cut off a finger and be like, it's all right. I got nine more. <laughs> when she still lived at home years ago, she had a wreck coming home from work, fell asleep, hit a, a concrete mailbox. I mean, destroyed her car. She come home, like after midnight. She didn't want to wake anybody up, so she just went to bed. She got up the next morning, come downstairs. They were eating breakfast, looked at her. She's got dried up blood on her face, glasses in her hair. They look out the window, said, what happened? Said, well, I had a wreck. The car's twisted like a pretzel outside. They're like, why didn't you tell somebody? Said, well, I didn't want to wake anybody up. I thought we'd take care of it in the morning. I mean, that high pain tolerance, right? If something happens to me, y'all, and I disappear, <laughs> just, just saying, just in, in a public atmosphere, okay? Um, some of, you, some of you ADD bounce off the wall. You got so much energy, you don't even know what to do, right? You, you're having trouble sitting right here in church right now. Just shaking. Some of you are having a hard time staying awake. Your energy level is so low, you don't even know what to do. But I can promise you none of you chose that, did you? You didn't choose the chemical makeup of your body. It's the way we're put together. Your body has something called oxytocin. You ever heard of that? It's the connection chemical. It's what brings a bond to people. Oxytocin was found in these little rats called uh, prairie voles. You ever heard of this? They're like little rats in the desert. They mate for life. Uh, people were astounded by these rats. Because, you know, rats are pretty um, a little frisky, right? You know, they kind of tend to procreate really quickly. And they're not really, you know, concerned about who with. And, uh, but these prairie vole rats... They made it for life, and so they felt like this was really abnormal for this, this species. So they did this study on these rats, and what they found is that they have very high levels of oxytocin in their body, this connection chemical. So they reduced the levels of oxytocin in, in the bodies of these rats, and they became as frisky as other rats and rabbits. Okay, It totally changed everything. They were not worried about their spouse anymore. Previously... If one of the rats died, they would not even find another mate. They would stay single for the rest of their life, these rodents. Oxytocin is in our bodies. It's when a mother nurses a newborn baby, and they say that you need to bond with your baby. It releases oxytocin. When a man and woman are married, and the Bible says two become one, and they have sex, it releases oxytocin. There's a bond that's made there. God knew it was there. God gave us the chemicals. Why God never designed for us to be... um, One with everybody, okay? I'm just going to leave it at that, right? Man and woman, that's what sex is designed for, okay? When you pet a dog, it releases oxytocin. That's why we have man's best friend. Because there's a chemical that is designed for connection. People with low levels of oxytocin, it has been proven they have a harder time connecting and forming relationships with other people. What does all of this have to do with anything? Elijah ran because he was scared. Some of us are running and we don't know why. God is good and God is faithful. And we do know God's promises, but we can't define what the problem is. Let me just go ahead and help you today. Our bodies are broken. And it's okay to make this statement. Write this down on your outline right there at that check mark. I need help. That's an action statement for us to make today. For somebody that just set you free because you never thought you could admit 
Because you didn't know what it was. You didn't know what was wrong. And you thought you were a, you've been told sometime that you didn't have enough faith and you didn't love God enough. And that's why you feel that way. And you just need to pray more and you need to seek God more. And all of those things are true. But we are broken people. There's no shame when you have a headache and you take some medicine, is there? There's no shame in that. My mom passed of cancer. There was no shame that she had cancer. She couldn't handle that. She couldn't control it. There was no shame that she took treatment for her cancer. So if there's something wrong chemically in my body, listen to me today, there is no shame if you need help. A counselor, some medicine, somebody to pray for you, there is no shame. My chemistry is a part of who I am. Number two, write this down, that's important, my connections. My connections. Look at what happened when he got afraid. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. The one who was supposed to be with him, to help him, to look after him, to care for him. He left him. Then he went, underline this word, alone, into the wilderness. Not a lot of parties out in the wilderness. Not a lot of people out in the wilderness. And he traveled all day. That's how far he went. Here's the problem. Isolation is the enemy's playground. It's simply like animals in the wild. You ever seen them try to look for something for dinner. And if they can isolate one, you know what they do? They drag it off from the other pack, and then they all pounce on it. See, the enemy, if he can get us wounded, he will drag you off by yourself, and he will begin to pounce on you. I can tell you number one warning sign every time that something is wrong with somebody is they isolate, they run, and they go by themselves. They will not answer a phone call. They will not answer a text message. They will not come to church, and they will not participate for whatever excuse or reason they want to give isolation. We are not created to be isolated. As a matter of fact, it's proven in a lot of different ways. Some of you have heard the study. It was a study done for, um, to try to figure out addiction. And they took a rat, again, put it in a cage. They put water, and they put drug water in the cage. Some of you have probably heard of this study. And they said, what's going to happen to this rat? Which one will he choose? 100% of the time, the rat used the drug water until it died. 100% of the time. So here's what they walked away with. We're just going to choose drugs every time. Anything that fits our life that we find we're going to overindulge, we're going to overuse, and that's the problem. But then somebody else said, you know what? We didn't give this rat a, an option. We didn't give him much to look forward to. See, rats are pretty social, right? I'm trying to keep it PG this morning, but we're a little PG-13. Rats are a little social, right? So they like company. And uh, they said, let's do this. We're going to make Disney World for rats. It's called Rat Park. You can look this up. So here's what they did. They gave the rat other rats to um, hang out with. And uh, they put toys, rat toys, in this rat park. They put the tubes that the rats love to run in. They put everything a rat loves, rat heaven, cheese, snacks, and also included the water and the drug water. And here's what they discovered. They were able to reduce the overdose rate from 100% to 0%. Not one rat in Rat Park overdosed on any of the drugs. Now, some of them dabbed it a little bit. (laughs) But never to the point that it harmed them. Here's what they learned. Community is essential to our core. When you isolate by yourself and you minimize your options, we will be self-destructive every single time. But when you run in community and you stay with people and you have choices and you have options and you press into life and you stay out of the wilderness, God will help you. Write this statement down. I need hands. I need hands to hold me. I need hands to lift me up. I need hands to guide me. I need hands to pat me and tell me it's going to be okay. We all need hands. Now, Some of you, 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 you like just a few people around you. Well, maybe your oxytocin is a little low. That's okay. But you still need people. Elijah made a grave mistake because he ran 
from the things that mattered the most. He was afraid and he ran. Number three, here's another one of these things that affects where we are. It's my circumstances. Notice what he did. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. There he is. He just hit the lowest of the low. He was afraid. He couldn't explain it. I know he couldn't explain it. I mean, what sense does it make? He just come off the most amazing miracles recorded in the Bible. Now he's afraid. He's running. He's isolating. And now here he is, right? In the circumstance he created, he is ready to die. His circumstance. Have you ever noticed, though, that God will use your circumstances oftentimes to bring the greatest miracles and the greatest growth of all of your life? Sometimes where you end up, even though it may not have been where God wanted you to go, God will use your circumstance right where you are to create the greatest miracles. I love this story because it says he sat under a solitary broom tree. So in other words, wherever he landed, he found one good spot. And do you know that the broom tree is actually an illustration of God caring and taking care of us? Because the broom tree, if you go back, and I thought, what's a broom tree? I don't, you know, y'all got broom trees in yards? Like, I don't know, what's a broom tree? So I started looking it up and studying, and I learned that the broom tree was used for shelter. It was used for a place of protection. It was used for a safe place to go, to get out of the elements, to get out of the sun, to get out of all the things that were causing harm. It was a place of rest. The broom tree was also used for fire. It was a a tree that they would often use because it would light easily. They could have heat and they could cook with it. In the book of Job, it talks about Job actually, in emergency, actually eating the root of a broom tree. In other words, this broom tree actually was sustainable for life. And I don't think it's any accident or any coincidence that God would greet him right at his lowest with a symbol of something that would provide and take care of every need that he had. I believe today that the local church is the broom tree. I believe that God's house, if doing it correctly, is a place where we all recognize we are all broken. Listen, it's not just you. It's not just your circumstance. Now You may may be struggling with something that the person behind you never understands. But again, we're all broken just in different ways. And oftentimes, it's our circumstances that make people go, you know what? You know, I tried this, and I tried this, and I tried this. And here's that famous statement, God, I've tried everything, so I just need you to do it. And sometimes God will use that circumstance to push us to the broom tree. To the place where we can find our community and our support and the presence of God and people to lock hands with and to do life with in our circumstance. Look, write this statement down. I need hope. I need hope. Here was Elijah saying, I'm just here that I'll die. Praying that it would be the end of his life. But what you need today is you need hope. And I'm here to tell you today that Not to minimize the struggle, not to minimize the circumstance, the feelings or the emotions. But what you need is you need hope. Because let me explain something to us. Our circumstances, they change, don't they? Right now, we're in January. None of you are really tending to a lot of flower gardens right now, are you? Most of it's all dead. It's died away. All the work that you did last year, planting, tending, pulling weeds, it's all dead. It's died away. But you know what? Spring's coming and new life is about to take place. And then all that work that you'll do in spring of preparing and getting it ready, summertime is beautiful. You're going to reap the harvest of all the work. But you know what? Fall's coming again and it's all going to start to die away. And January 2024 will be here and it will all be dead yet again. But you know what that tells me? Hang on. Another season is coming. In all of our lives, there are seasons Where everything feels like it's all dead. And then there's a season where life is going to start to come again. You're going to start feeling that freshness of spring. And you're going to work. And summer's going to come. And you're going to reap the harvest of it all. And then you're going to see fall coming. And things of your life are going to start to die away again. And you're going to feel that pressure. And you're going to feel that pain. And there's going to be some tension. And then it's all going to feel like it all wasted away. And you're going to go, God, where did you go? And he says, but hang on. There's hope. It's all just a season.
We all have circumstances. And the number four, write this one down. Here's another part of our makeup that we're struggling with, that we deal with, is my consciousness. My consciousness. Your consciousness is, a, is your self-awareness. It's, it's how you approach yourself. You talk to yourself. You coach yourself. You Listen to what Elijah said. He said, I've had enough. <laughs> it's Sunday. It's first day of the week. So we've already said that today. You said that to your kids. I've had enough. Don't say another word. We're not even going to church. All of you watching at line, I got you right there. But I'm glad you're online. It's good. It's good. I've had enough. Take my life. Listen to this statement right here. Some of us are making statements like this. I'm no better than my ancestors who have already died. I'm done. And then we start to tell about how big of a failure we are. How, how bad we are. How bad we messed up. You struggle with something, come on, it's 21 days of prayer and fasting. It's a brand new year. New year, new me. And then six days in, you messed up. You're such a loser. I told you, I knew you couldn't do it. And then you hear the voices of everybody else who's ever told you you couldn't do it. And then you start saying, I'm no better than my ancestors who've already died. Your feelings are not facts. They're not. Feelings are not facts. Feelings change. Just like those seasons we talked about, your feelings change. Some of you happily married when you woke up, before you went to bed. <laughs> you know, still up in the air. We'll decide in the morning. <laughs> See how you feel. You never feel like going to the gym, do we? No. The front door is the heaviest thing in the gym. But then when you get in there and you leave, you go, whew, I feel better. That was good. But you know what happens the next day? You got to get your feelings under control because you don't feel it again. Some of us have accepted our feelings as if they are facts. And that's what we're communicating to ourselves. The Bible says that your words have the power of life and death. They can shape a room. If you don't think words are important, I always say it. You tell a, a mama with a newborn baby, Whew, they'll get cuter. <laughs> Those words matter. Come on, guys. Does this outfit make me look? Mm, guard those words because they matter. Believe it or not, the words you speak over yourself, they matter. They matter. Don't disregard or disrespect the creation that God made in you. Now look, God could have made me a little taller. I get it. He could have put about 50 more pounds on me, but I mean, he didn't, so it's just what it is. So I just got to deal with it. Maybe in heaven, you know what I'm saying? Maybe that's the payoff in heaven. He's like, hey, man, here you go. Check it out. Like, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. But here's what I know. God's not surprised by where you are. And God is big enough to handle a conversation where you go, God, this is, this is how I feel. And God, I need you. Write this down. I need honesty. I need honesty. We're lying to ourselves. God's looking at us going, I can't believe you're talking about yourself that way. Don't you know that I made you and I don't make any junk? No leftovers here. Fearfully and wonderfully made, says the Bible. Fearfully, wonderfully made. Some of us just need a little honesty. If you can't talk honest to yourself, find somebody. Those hands that we needed, you need them to be able to tell you the truth of God. And then the last one, and this is really what sums up all of them, is my choices. It's my choices. There sits Elijah, end of his rope, bottom of the barrel. He's one step away from doing something harmful to himself. And then just like God does, he lay down to sleep under that broom tree. But as he was sleeping... An angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. You know, if you'll notice your yesterday, at every moment when you thought like that was going to be it and you had reached your limit, somehow God showed up and he brought you through it. Some of you think back, go, I don't even know how I ever got through that season. How did I survive that? You may have some scars, may have some bad memories, but you made it through. You know how you made it through? Because God is always showing up. Because he loves you. But now, what we do with that 
is up to us. There's Elijah praying for death under the tree. God sends an angel. Hey, Elijah, what are you doing, man? Didn't God tell you to go do something? I don't think you're supposed to be here under this broom tree, Elijah. I don't think you're supposed to be talking that way, Elijah. Get up. Go get something to eat. We got work to do. Strengthen yourself. Here's what I believe God's saying to us today. Get up. Get up. God's not done with you. God is not through with you. Yeah, but my circumstance. Okay. Yeah, but you don't know how tired I am. Okay. But you don't know my feelings. Okay. Get up. Lean in to what brings you strength. 21 days of prayer and fasting. Worship. Community. God's word. It's there for us. Write this down. I need healing. I need healing. Those are the decisions, the choices that God gives us to make. Listen to me. You did not choose your chemistry. You didn't, you didn't choose your struggle. You got high blood pressure. You got low testosterone. You got, you didn't choose it. But you can choose what you do about it. You can't choose all of the people you're surrounded with. That's called family. But you can choose what you do about it. You can't always choose your circumstances. But you can choose what you do about it. God gave us choices. And today, you have a choice to get up and to receive healing. And that's what I want to pray for us today. I want to pray healing over us today. Will you bow your head, close your eyes with me? If you're our guest today, nothing weird or funny is going to happen. Nobody's coming to get you online. I just ask that you just eliminate distraction just right in this moment. Let God speak to you. But our band's going to come up and play softly, and I'm going to pray for us. And two things. Number one, Ephesians tells us that we can't do it under our power but His working within us. And so today, if you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, that's where you start. That's where the miracle takes place. You need a relationship with Jesus. And I want to pray that for us today. Don't miss it. If you need Jesus today, don't miss that. And then I want to pray healing over us today. That God would take where we are and when we leave this place, as deep down as we've been today and as heavy as this is, that God would just begin to lift something off of your shoulders as you present it to Him and let Him carry it. So, Father, right now, for any of us in this room watching online, I pray that if we don't have a personal relationship with you, that today's our day. We confess sin. We confess we've done it our own way. And, Jesus, we know we need you. Thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you for love. Thank you for forgiveness. Today, we receive relationship with you. Today, I pray for all of us that healing would begin to take place across all the broken places of our lives. God, you know the enemies come to steal, kill, and destroy, but we know that you're greater, you're bigger than all of that. So today, we just pray that you begin to do something special. Revive us, restore us, make us new. Jesus, everything you begin today, you're going to get the credit for it. I believe healing has taken place. God, I believe you're beginning to encourage and restore. God, do what we can't do on our own. We trust you with it. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, can we honor Jesus together? Come on, any good? I'm so thankful he didn't leave us.